in Colorado at Boulder. I've known Meredith uh, since the graduate, being a graduate student with her at, at Harvard. Um, Meredith then went on to do a postdoc at the Clermont Institute, um, and then I guess a professor. She also has several awards, such as the Sloan Award and the Chateau Brun uh, Fellowship. Um, so she's mainly working in biophysics, and today she's going to talk about filament visualization by the replacement. Okay, thanks, Jen. Um, is the mic at a good level? Can everyone hear me? Okay, yeah. okay good enough. <coughs> All right, so, um, so I'm going to be talking to you today about a collaborative project that was done with um, people at Colorado, Dick McIntosh, who's an um, eminent senior cell biologist in the molecular and cellular developmental biology department. Um, Lauren Huff, who was a grad student who worked on a project with him. Matt Glazer, who's a um, computational liquid crystal physicist who collaborated on the computations in this project. And um, Aaron Schwaba, who is a rotation student from biochemistry. So we're covering three different departments with our project here. Okay, so you've just heard a lot about motor proteins from the earlier talks. Um, I thought I would just mention one interesting calculation that if you haven't seen before, it's good to know. It's sort of amusing related to this problem. It helps motivate why, mo why do you need motor proteins, okay? So, um, so if you need to move proteins that are primarily manufactured in the center of the cell to the edge, you run into a problem when you have to deal with really large cells. Okay, so for example, you have neurons that start in your spinal cord and extend to the tip of your finger to be able to move your finger. Okay, so you have a cell that can have a distance in your body of over a meter. And so if you just said, okay, I have a protein that I make in the center of the cell and I want to see how long it's going to take to get to the edge, say that had a radius of about three nanometers and it was diffusing in water and we just wanted to know what would be the typical time for it to diffuse that meter, the answer would be that you have to wait for about 10,000 years, okay? And that's for something that's pretty small, right? So larger objects like the pigments that we just heard about, those problems can be even worse. Okay, so this is partially why we need motor proteins, and um, their kind of first known function involved intracellular transport for kinesin and microtubules in specific, okay? And I'm going to be talking today about kinesin and microtubules, so just to remind you, microtubules are these long filaments, they're about 20 nanometers in diameter, and they can be quite long in cells. And there are kinesins that can walk on microtubules. And a couple of key things to remember about microtubules, again, that you've already heard, they're chemically polar. <coughs> they have a plus end and a minus end. And this motor can use that chemical polarity to know which direction it wants to go. They're made up um, of an eight nanometer dimer, okay, repeating dimer unit. And um, they have a variable that's around 13 protofilaments. Okay, so these different little rows of beads represent different protofilaments that can roll up to form a cylinder with about 13 of them. Okay, so this is the type of thing you usually hear about when you think of kinesin and microtubules. And there's been a, a lot of beautiful work on this over the years, again, some of which you've heard about. I'm just gonna show one um, movie from the great, some representative of the single molecule experiments on this. This is from Jeff Gellis's lab at Brandeis. This DIC image, there's a vertically oriented microtubule and this little, um, black and white smear is a bead that has one kinesin attached to it. And what you can see is that over time, the bead moves when it's being dragged along by a single kinesin, okay? So you can understand lots of things about this, the velocity, the force dependence, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about kinesins and microtubules today, but I'm gonna be talking about their role in a somewhat different problem, okay? Because it turns out that there are kinesins that can promote these filaments, these microtubules, falling apart, okay? They're depolymerization. So these are a special subcategory called kinesin 8 and 13 proteins. They promote this disassembly, and they're really biologically important in what's called the mitotic spindle. Um, okay, so, um, so during cell division, a structure illustrated here forms. Here green represents microtubules and blue represents DNA. This roughly football-shaped structure of microtubules forms and, um, among other things, grabs onto the DNA and at cell division will pull it apart into the two daughter cells. Okay? So mitotic spindle made of microtubules, very important in cell division. And these proteins are important in a, in a way that I'm just going to show you. Okay? So, um, so I, I just threw in this picture of the kinesin family tree just to um, really briefly show you that there are lots of kinesins. Here's an analysis that was done to try to see how, from different organisms, different kinesins are related in their seasons. And here in red is your conventional kinesins, kinesin ones. And up here at the top is this kinesin eight and kinesin 13 group. They're related to each other and they play a role in this disassembly problem. 
Okay, so there's been a huge amount of cell biological work on this, and I'm just going to show you one illustrative example so you can get kind of the idea, okay? So this is an example with a protein called MCAC. That stands for mitotic centromere associated kinase. And this is an experiment from Tim Mitchison's lab on Xenopus egg extracts. Okay, so the idea is you can take these eggs, you can smush them up in just the right way, and if you do everything right, you can get uh, mitotic spindle-like structures to form. So if you look at these top pictures first, what you'll see is red, which is uh, microtubules, blue, which is DNA, and these little things um, are these kind of reconstituted mitotic spindle-like structures. Okay? In the middle panel, they have depleted this MCAC protein in Xenopus. Okay? And so what you'll notice is that when you compare the top panel, there's this huge blob of red, and it's even white in the middle because the intensity is too high. Basically, these things that were nice and small have gone nuts. Microtubules have become extremely long. Okay? And then it can be rescued. Sorry, I should mention the scale bar here is about 20 microns. Okay, so these things get huge. It can be rescued, and it is, that's what's in the bottom panel. Putting the MCAC back in, things sort of go back to normal. Okay, so th this type of evidence helps help people understand um, that these are important in making the microtubules the right length during cell division and led to the understanding that they're important in depolarization. Okay? So here's some more work on MCAC from Joe Howard's lab. In vitro, it's possible to take this protein, it's stained green in this image, microtubules are red, and they can see that the MCAC will, will tend to go to microtubule ends, sit there, and tend to chop it off. Okay, so here's a picture of their model. The proteins can bind. This particular kinesin diffuses on the microtubule, sticks at the end, and helps chop the thing off. Okay? So there's been some very nice work on MCAC. Um, and I just want to make a quick note on what this has to do with some of the other things you've been hearing about. Okay? So it's a motor protein problem. I think it's interesting in and of itself. But, um, but in the work about active gels and cytoskeletal systems that you've heard about, mainly you've kind of seen motors that play a role in causing forces, applying forces to filaments and causing contractions. And obviously that's very important, okay? And in active gel theories, because this is so important, um, usually motors are put in as active crosslinks, right? Things can apply, that can apply force. And in these models, typically filaments have fixed length. Okay, and so one of the directions that we're interested in going with this work that's maybe relevant to this community is thinking about what happens when you might have other proteins, say motors, that start messing with the filaments, causing them to shorten, or there are also proteins that can cause them to grow, and what those length fluctuations do in, in active gel physics. Okay, so that's, that's kind of a long-term thing we're interested in. Today I'm just going to tell you about this problem. Um, so we're not the first ones to think about things like this. There's been a lot of work that I'm not going to explain detail related to kind of motors and depolarization. Just what's kind of important about this problem that hasn't all been seen together in work like this before is the importance of collective effects with all the motors, their coupling to filament dynamics, and also transient time-dependent effects. Okay, so again, if you, uh, I can talk to you more about this if you're interested. Um, this slide I just put in to remind me that these kinesin 8 and 13s have been studied for a very long time. There's a rich literature that I'm um, really not doing justice to. Uh, but the kinesin 8s, let me just mention, that I'm going to focus on today, help make microtubules the right length, and they also can move on microtubules. Okay? So here's uh, just a brief experimental summary to show you the types of things that we're interested in. I'll show you the experiments and then tell you briefly about our model. Okay? So this is work from Joe Howard's lab on KIP3P. This is one of these depolarizing kinesins from yeast. Okay? So here's the experiment. You take microtubules and stick them to a glass slide. The microtubules are stained. Okay? And so here, this is a series of panels at different times. So at the top, you can see my two microtubules that are st sitting there. The second picture, that's t equals zero. That's when they flowed in KIP3P. Okay? And what you see is after that, the microtubules are getting shorter and shorter as you go down, that's time going on. Okay? And then from this, you can do a type of analysis where you take a microtubule take out one row of pixels along the center of it and line those images up on top of each other. It's called a chimogram. So if you look at this picture on the right, um, across is the length of the microtubule and down is time. And so what you see is initially there's a lot of light and then it gets darker and darker. See this like dark band kind of invading? That's because the microtubule is shortening as time goes on, okay? Um, so you can see this shortening. The important thing that, we, that I want you to get from this picture is that there's depolarization that it happens from the plus end. Okay, so in this picture, you see on the left boundary not much changes. 
on the right, there's a big change. Okay, so it's plus n. The motors tend to move towards that direction. So when a microtubule binds, it wants to go to that end and depolymerize at that end. And a really important observation <coughs> in this paper was that of length-dependent depolymerization. Okay, and to show that, let me show you one other graph in the paper. Focus here on the upper left, where here they measured microtubule length as a function of time for a number of different microtubules. Oh, I should mention one other thing about this that I forgot, which is that these microtubules are chemically stabilized. So if you know about microtubules, you know they can undergo dynamic instability, but not these ones, because they've been forced not to. So these can only shorten because of the motors, otherwise they would just sit there forever. Okay, that's important. Okay? So when you measure microtubule length versus time, here's t equals zero, the motors come in, what you see is that initially shortening happens, um, it kind of starts, and then over time it slows down and it kind of tails off to nothing. Okay? And the kind of maximum rate, how fast this can get, depends on the microtubule length. So if you have a short microtubule, it never depolymerizes very quickly, whereas if you have a long one, can get a much higher rate, a bigger slope here, okay? And um, this is potentially very interesting because it provides basically a way to measure how long a microtubule is that you could use to set the right length, right? So imagine that you didn't just have these static microtubules. Imagine that you let microtubules grow, but then you also added these motors, okay? The longer microtubules would tend to get this bigger rate of shortening, and that balance you could use to select a length. Okay, so this, so this was suggested as a possible cellularly important way for microtubules to kind of be tuned to a specific length, okay? So, so that was what was really interesting to us. And so in our work, we really focused in the, the theory on what controls this length-dependent depolymerization, okay? What range of parameters allow this to happen? What kind of lengths can you get? Um, and we have a paper on this if you um, want to really know the details, you should look at that, because this is very superficial. Um, two, uh, Mark, I have two minutes. Okay, so it's going to be extremely superficial. So, um, so our model is uh, pretty, I'll give you the basic ingredients and then one kind of result. Okay, so imagine you have a filament, motors can bind, they can move, they like to go to one end, they can fall off, and then at the end they can do something interesting. Okay, in particular they can go to the end and chop off dimers. Okay, so here it is, it's chopping off a blue brick. And there are interesting details about how that happens. Okay? It could happen processively, meaning the motor chops but goes backwards, or non-processively, and we looked at that, but I don't really have time to tell you about it. In our, in our theory, we looked both at Monte Carlo, kinetic Monte Carlo simulations of the full model, and some mean field theory analysis. Again, I won't tell you any details. I'll just show you um, a couple of uh, brief results. Okay? You, can, you can see kind of what the density of motors along the microtubule looks like, and because they tend to go to the right, there aren't going to be many on the left. There's an exponential profile to a constant value, and then a clump that forms up at the plus end where they're all crammed together. Okay? And because of that, um, we can see how that affects this length-dependent depolymerization. So here's kind of our main result that I'd like you to look at, and I'll finish with this. In this upper curve, I'm plotting simulated length versus time, and these different colors are different motor concentrations. Okay? So if you don't have many motors, it's kind slow, lots of motors, it goes much faster. Bottom panel is from the same data, only it's the rate, so the slope of this curve, as a function of length. Okay, and so what you'll see is that when it's, the microtubule is long, it depolymerizes at <coughs> a constant rate, there it goes, shortening, shortening, shortening. At some point, this rate plummets and goes to zero as the microtubule disappears. Okay, so there's this crossover from this kind of steady state shortening to where it starts to realize it's near the end, it's not getting enough motors, the rate goes crashing down. Okay? And as you vary the motor concentration, this length changes a lot. Okay? So this is one of our key results, is that um, this crossover length, so we kind of figured out where this crossover happens by just figuring out where this rate drops by some amount. Okay? Um, the points are from the simulations, the blue lines are from the mean field theory I don't have time to tell you about. And the important thing is that this varies by a huge amount. So it could be 15 microns down to a few microns, depending on how many motors you have around. Okay? And we think this is important um, because it's so sensitive. And in particular, we think this may be related to an experimental discrepancy. Okay, so the experiments from one group, the ones that I showed you, were done with not very many motors. They saw this uh, length-dependent depolymerization. And we would predict that for them, any microtubule that's like 17, uh, 17 microns or shorter should show these effects. It should be really important. 
Another group did experiments with a much higher motor concentration. They didn't see light dependent depolarization. And we predict that they shouldn't unless the microtubules are five microns or shorter. Okay? So it could be that um, it, if it did occur, it just wasn't very prominent, except, except for the very short microtubules. Okay? So this may explain the differences in experiments. And this really highlights for us the importance to, of knowing what <coughs> the parameters are, particularly the motor concentration in cells, to be able to say whether or not this is a biologically important way of affecting microtubules. So, um, so, so I'll stop there. Basically what we did in this work was make this very minimal model of how these motors can move and also depolarize microtubules. And kind of our main conclusion that I had time to tell you about was that it's very strongly dependent on motor concentration. Okay? So that's the brief advertisement. If you're interested, ask me more about it or take a look at the paper. Okay, thanks for your attention. Thanks for those questions. So, do, do you have any idea what the molecular mechanism of the speaking out is? Uh, whether it's physiologically significant? The, the mechanism of what? The, how, how, like, the, the actual process, what really happens? How can the, the motor release depolarization? How, how the motor promotes depolarization? Yeah, yeah, on molecular level. Yeah, so the molecular, the molecular details of that are not well understood. There's um, kind of I basically, say, I basically say that from the experiments right now, there's some kind of speculation, but it's not really known. No. Exactly what it does to depolarize is not understood. Sort of the short answer. I can tell you more about what people speculate if you want to know afterwards. I wonder if, uh, if, if your findings can help explain the, the Mitchison MCAC result, because that was you know, a really dramatic effect of change of the like, <coughs> Yeah, so... so so our results kind of would be consistent with that, um, but I guess I would say that people kind of already knew that, that. so our results kind of have something quantitative to say about how that happens, but it was sort of already known that these proteins promote depolarization and, and help set the right length. But so qualitatively, that, that was correct. But yeah, the, this kind of change in length, it would sort of be predicted by what